It's the meme that dreams are made on. Every four years, the Bitcoin halving rolls around, a squeezing the supply of fresh BTC and uh, firing up the rocket ship. A few months later, and we're all off to the moon. Sounds too good to be true. It sounds too good to be true, but it works every time. Or does it? According to a red hot take from one crypto VC, the four year Bitcoin cycle is not only cancelled this year, but it's been dead for almost a decade. OK, we'll take the bait, strap in and let's find out if there's anything to this. The VC behind this claim is the London based Outlier Ventures. The company describes itself as the world's leading Web3 accelerator and most active Web3 investor by volume of investments. Outlier's portfolio includes the likes of Brave, Fetch AI, and Ocean Protocol. And its business partners include Aptos, Filecoin, Hedera, Nier, Polkadot, Polygon, and Wormhole. Outlier was founded in 2014, so the name carries that uh, pre Ethereum. OG pedigree. They probably didn't last this long by making uh, frivolous claims. So let's see what they have to say about the Bitcoin cycle. In early September, Outlier posted an article to its website entitled Bitcoin halving, the four year cycle is dead. And it was penned by their research lead Jasper Demir. In it, he makes the case uh, the Bitcoin halving no longer has a fundamental impact on the price of BTC. And this has been the case since 2016. Now, between the spot Bitcoin ETF launches in the US and the pre halving all time high this year, we have heard some grumbling about how this time is different. But to say that this time has been different every time since 2016, we have to admit uh, that's a new one. So uh, hats off to Jasper for the fresh angle here. So the article begins with a few observations about the price of Bitcoin. Uh, for example, that BTC leads and the rest of the crypto market follows. And this is one of the most basic principles in crypto. Unless you try and your luck with micro cap cryptos, which play in a league of their own, the fate of your investment depends on what Bitcoin is doing. Bitcoin's price action has tended to follow four year cycles of expansion and contraction. And orthodoxy tells us that these cycles are shaped by the Bitcoin halving. Jasper explains the two main reasons behind this thinking. The first is a matter of supply side fundamentals. The halving reduces the amount of new BTC entering circulation, and this leads to relative scarcity and price appreciation as demand outpaces availability. The second is psychological. You see, the mere perception of a scarcity reinforces expectations that Bitcoin's price will increase. This has been the case previously, and it has turned the Bitcoin halving into a news story. Media attention magnifies the bullish halving narrative, and demand tends to increase. According to the article, the fundamental driver behind BTC price action has been irrelevant for the past two cycles. The notion of the four year market cycle based on the Bitcoin halving is basically hot air at this point, uh, Jasper says. However, he does emphasize that this doesn't make outlier ventures bearish on crypto. The article begins making its case against the cycle theory by pointing out Bitcoin's unusually weak price performance since this year's halving. At the 125 days post halving mark, a BTC was up by a median of about 22% in prior cycles or epochs as they are called here. But this time around, Bitcoin is actually down by 8%. For reference, we are currently in the fifth epoch, meaning the four year period in between each halving. And the fifth epoch has proven to be the worst for BTC price performance in history. Never before in Bitcoin's history has BTC been down 125 days post halving mark versus its price on halving day. And this doesn't sound too good, but it's worth taking a closer look at the data behind this claim. Jasper uses the 125 days after halving mark as a point of reference, but also shares a chart showing other points in the second to fifth epochs. The fifth epoch is underwhelming so far, but you could say the same for the third epoch. It spent most of the first 100 days underwater. Also, if we look at the change in price from day 100 to day 125, the fourth and fifth epochs saw similar price movements. Uh, BTC dumped by 15% both times. Overall, this table shows us quite a lot of volatility and only four epochs. So there's arguably not enough here to base any conclusions on. However, Jasper has uh, many more charts up his sleeve. So uh, let's move on. 
Okay, welcome to the Bro Crypto Podcast. I'm Chadimus Maximus, go by MaxChad100 on Twitter. And I am Giga Dick, the dude with the biggest PNL in all of crypto. Bro, bro, say what? My PNL is 100% bigger than yours. Bro, please. I was longing Doge and drinking Neat Belvedere while you were still spot buying BTC on Mount Gox, bro. Bro. You still driving a 2020 Aventador. Where's your Bugatti at? Bro, bro, when Bonk hits a dollar, I'm gonna be rocking a super yacht while you're still stuck in traffic, bro. The Bro Crypto Podcast is sponsored by the Coin Bureau Deals page. If you're looking for trading fee discounts of up to 70% and sign-up bonuses of up to $100,000 and amazing discounts on hardware wallets, then don't be a bro, be in the know and check out the link in the description below. And now, back to the show. Bro, crypto podcast. Bro. 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 The article then discusses the daily Bitcoin block rewards. Now, these are, of course, what gets halved in the halving, so they deserve closer attention. By reducing the block reward for miners by half, the network reduces the rate at which new BTC is created. This reduces the new supply entering the market, thereby slowing the journey towards the max supply of 21 million BTC. And as you can see from this chart, the rate of BTC issuance has flattened drastically since earlier epochs. Aside from reducing inflation, the main argument for the halving's market impact is its effect on the miner economy. After the halving, miners have to adapt to a lower margin environment. They may no longer be able to afford to invest in the latest hardware, making their operations less efficient than competitors and reducing profitability. Miners who find themselves underwater will often sell reserves in order to keep ticking along until mining becomes profitable again. Depending on the health of these reserves, some miners may eventually shut down and their operators may go bankrupt. This reduces the network's hash rate and mining difficulty, making mining more profitable for those miners who do remain. All of this is extremely significant for miners. But what does it mean for the price of BTC? The article imagines an extreme scenario where after the halving, miners immediately sell all of their new block rewards. This allows us to isolate the new supply of BTC as a variable and determine its market impact. Remember, it's the reduction in this new supply coming from the miners that is supposed to create scarcity and drive prices up. But when you look at the potential market impact of all miners selling their daily BTC block rewards, it appears to be negligible. This is illustrated on a chart showing the total daily block reward in USD obtained by all miners divided by the total volume traded in the market in USD. Until mid-2017, miners' daily block rewards amounted to more than 1% of the total volume of BTC being traded. As the market has grown and halvings have continued, this has decreased dramatically. Today, the combined sell pressure from all miners selling all their daily block rewards immediately would account for just 0.17% of the total market volume. The article acknowledges that this doesn't account for miners' block reward reserves, which may be potentially sold after the halving. However, it does show that the notion of a supply shock created by the halving is unrealistic. Or rather, it's a shock felt only by the miners themselves. And this is because the daily block rewards, both before and after the halving, are a minuscule proportion of the volume of BTC traded every day. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, go ahead and halve the like button for us. A good karate chop will do. And make sure you subscribe and have your bell notifications on too, so you'll never miss another upload. Next, the article turns to the pre-halving run-up. This period relates to the psychological impact of the halving, because an approaching halving is perceived as a bullish catalyst. As such, optimism and demand for BTC may increase prior to the day of halving. On the face of it, this certainly appears to have been the case earlier this year. In the 200 days before the 2024 halving, BTC ripped by almost 2.5 times. And this was a pre-halving tear not seen since the second epoch, when Bitcoin dominance was 99%. 
Compare that to the 200 days before the 2020 halving uh, when BTC barely moved. But let's be honest, the halving wasn't the uh, only big story in crypto this year. We have to, of course, consider the ETF factor. The launch of the US spot Bitcoin ETFs in January created enormous buy pressure, around 915,000 BTC so far. And most of this buying took place in Q1, driving up prices so quickly that it arguably warped the current cycle, halving included. This article posits an argument that the ETFs merely pulled forward the demand and price action usually seen with the halving. Jasper dismisses this argument on the basis that the ETFs and halving are independent catalysts whose impact should be evaluated separately. Quote, they aren't mutually exclusive, and if the halving still mattered, we should have seen significant price action on the back of this double catalyst. He then shares an interesting chart showing BTC's price action in the 200-day run-up before the halving plotted against Google search volumes for Bitcoin halving and Bitcoin ETF. The chart shows that BTC's run-up this year was significantly more bullish than the average from epochs 2, 3, and 4. Moreover, you can see that total Google searches for Bitcoin halving did not start to explode until well after BTC had peaked in March. And this suggests that the hype around the halving was not the driver behind BTC's massive rally in Q1. Next, the article plots BTC's price performance for the 100 days after each catalyst, so 100 days post-ETF launch and 100 days post the halving. In the post-ETF period, BTC returned a 36% gain after 100 days. But in the post-halving period, BTC was up by just 7% after 100 days. As such, it seems clear that the ETF launch was a more meaningful catalyst for the price action than the halving. Okay, so the ETFs were a big deal for price action this year, and the halving wasn't so much. That seems to check out. But then the article makes a more eyebrow-raising contention, namely that the halving hasn't had a meaningful impact on the crypto market since 2016. Say what? Well, if we return to the chart showing the market impact of all miners immediately selling their BTC block rewards, we can see what Jasper is getting at here. Once again, the chart shows the total daily block reward in USD obtained by all miners divided by the total volume traded in the market in USD to assess the potential market impact if all new block rewards were to be sold immediately. This appears to have peaked around 5% in mid-2015 and declined sharply for the rest of the 2010s. By the 2016 halving, it was around 1%. By 2019, the chart had completely flatlined, and it has oscillated in a range between 0 and 0.2% ever since. If the daily BTC block reward decreases every epoch and daily traded volume of BTC increases as the market matures, the market impact of miners selling new block rewards will inevitably trend towards zero. When you plot these data on a chart and compare, you can see a sharp inverse correlation between decreasing block rewards and increasing trading volume. This was most pronounced in the third epoch from 2016 to 2020. Over that period, volume rose from under $1 billion to over $40 billion. At the same time, block rewards decreased from around 1% of daily traded volume to somewhere below 0.1%. Based on this data, Jasper does have a point. A trading volume has increased so dramatically that daily block rewards look irrelevant by comparison. In this sense, mid-2017 looks like the last time block rewards were not a negligible proportion of volume. However, it's important to consider what caused the increase in trading volume over time. Proponents of the halving-driven four-year cycle theory might argue that the halving, whether by squeezing BTC supply or through sheer narrative power, is responsible for the increase in trading volume. From this point of view, trading volume increasing as block rewards decrease is evidence of the halving's market impact. That's literally the whole point. A less fresh supply, more hype and new demand, prices go up. And voila, the halving effect. The article seeks to debunk this idea. And as such, Jasper provides an alternative account of what drove the increase in BTC's trading volume in the third epoch. And I'll give you a clue. 
it starts with an E. If you said EOS, you can see yourself out. Of course, I'm talking about Ethereum. In 2015, just before the third epoch, Ethereum launched, bringing smart contracts to crypto for the first time. And this paved the way for the ICO craze, which brought an explosion of new crypto tokens to the market for the first time. As the article puts it, Ethereum and the ICO craze, quote, drove trading volume to all pockets of the digital asset market, including BTC, and incentivized the exchanges to mature more quickly, allowing them to onboard users more easily and process larger trading volumes. And this seems to us a more persuasive catalyst than the Bitcoin halving. But this begs a question. What about 2020? BTC ripped 6.6 .6 times in the first year after the 2020 halving. Coincidence? Well, uh, Jasper has another alternative explanation for the explosion in trading volume that we saw in 2020 to 2021. He says the real reason for the rally was the expansion of the US money supply preceding the May 2020 halving. On the eve of the Bitcoin halving in 2020, the US money supply was up almost 25% year on year as a result of the government's pandemic response policies. As the article puts it, quote, the US money supply surged at an unprecedented rate in modern Western history, fueling speculation and inflation across various asset classes, including property, equities, private equity, and digital assets. This too is plotted on a chart, which clearly shows how Bitcoin's monster rally closely followed the expansion of the new money supply during the pandemic. So while 2020 was indeed a halving year, there was a much bigger macro catalyst that makes the halving look a little less important here. The article then turns to the question of miner supply ratio. Uh, for reference, this is the total BTC held by miners divided by the total BTC supply, or in other words, how much of the supply is held by the miners. The graph shared here shows a very clear downtrend beginning in Q2 2022, when the miners' supply ratio was around 9.75%. It's now around 9.2%. And this is no surprise because miners have to sell at some point and they will be able to mine less new BTC as the halving schedule progresses. It's hard to see this downtrend reversing unless miners actually start buying massive amounts of BTC. Interestingly though, this was the case for at least one miner this year. In July, Marathon Digital bought $100 million worth of BTC and said it plans to buy more. And this is the exact opposite of a miner being squeezed by the halving and capitulating out of its reserves to keep the lights on. It's remarkable, almost as if they saw the halving coming and prepared for it. By the way, if you're wondering why on earth a miner would want to buy Bitcoin, uh, you may be interested to learn that the price of mining one BTC this year has consistently been above the market price of Bitcoin ever since the halving. In May, the cost of mining one Bitcoin broke above $94,000. Anyway, in order for the halving to have a real effect on the price of Bitcoin separate from its mimetic power, the amount of BTC being traded globally would have to fall through the floor. And we can imagine, for example, 10 years from now, a lot more BTC will have been lost. And perhaps some government will be diamond handing a significant portion of the supply. In such a scenario, miners' selling of new block rewards and older reserves could make up a slightly larger proportion of the overall BTC traded than they do today. However, 10 years from now is also two halvings away. So to be honest, we don't expect miners to be moving the market in a big way unless they are going out of business and liquidating their entire reserves. Overall, it's a compelling case that we have here. Uh, the halving is a attractively simple catalyst. In Bitcoin's short history, it has lined up with other major bullish catalysts, allowing for some debate over how impactful the halving is. But when you look at the quantity of BTC being mined and sold by miners compared to the size of the overall market, the answer becomes clear. It's just too small a proportion to be a major fundamental catalyst. Where it does have power, it seems to be sheer narrative power. In sum then, it would be wise to focus on the macroeconomic forces instead of relying on the four-year cycle theory. 
Bitcoin is just too big to operate on its own schedule now. And for those of us outside the mining industry, the halving is starting to look more and more like a meme. Previous halvings have coincided with seismic changes from the dawn of Ethereum and massive money printing. But there's no guarantee that we will continue to see bullish macro events every four years. Just look at 2024. Now, sure, we had the ETFs, but they've been pretty quiet lately. Who knows? Uh, Epoch 5 might just be the uh, nail in the coffin of the four year cycle theory. This is not a bear post. I'm just saying. Okay, that's all for today, folks. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think about this halving driven four year cycle. Is it in the room with us right now? Drop a like if you're still waiting for that bullish macro catalyst. And don't forget to subscribe and turn your bell notifications on so you'll never miss another upload. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. This is Nick, signing off.